This week, a new flaw in Android OS, of all things, if you can believe that. Thousands of MicroTik routers have been hacked. John McAfee's unhackable Bitcoin wallet was, well, uh, hacked. Uh, misconfigured 3D printers are on the internet. Researchers using Sonar to steal your unlock code passwords. And the Linux Foundation has uh, pledged to improve the security of their code. Ron Gula from Gula Tech Adventures joins us for expert commentary on securing your political campaign. So stay tuned for this episode of Hack Naked News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show that brings you the security news each week. And despite popular belief, we do wear pants. It's Hack Naked News. The breach was huge news at the time. Linux monitoring tool. List of affected devices, you can check out the link in the show notes. Ars Technica is reporting that hackers have cracked the Nintendo Switch this week. Tracking people's locations and stuff like that. You'll want to be rolling out updates if you're using Lenovo hardware. Do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending your assets? Have you penetration tested your public assets? Start 2018 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. Welcome everyone to Hack Naked News, episode 187 for September 4th. 2018. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, coming at you live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island with a reminder for everyone to check out the on demand material here at Security Weekly, securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Tons of content on everything from uh, defending your applications against bad bots to improving the security of your Active Directory infrastructure um, and a whole lot more. So make sure you check them out at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Alrighty, in the news, um, Nightwatch cybersecurity uh, system says that all point bulletins sent out uh, to the Android OS team expose sensitive information about the user's device to any app that's installed on the phone, regardless of whether that app requires its data to function. It's information that can be used for any number of nefarious attacks, including physically locating the user. Basically, uh, in reading this article, I discovered that any app can use interprocess communications within the Android operating system to interact with a number of things, one of which is the Wi-Fi manager, to get your MAC address and your BSSIDs. Uh, after that, uh, potential attacks uh, can ensue, including being able to locate you uh, using freely available resources online uh, that track the location of Wi-Fi hotspots. So after being informed of this problem in March, Google fixed the issue earlier this month uh, and in Android P or Android 9. However, it said uh, that it doesn't plan to fix this in older versions of the operating system, so users should upgrade as soon as possible. However, that's problematic if you have a phone that can't be upgraded to Android OS version 9, or you're like me and you're scared of Android 9 and all of the things that come with it. Although now that there's a security flaw, I guess I'm forced to adopt some new software. The Linux Foundation is set to expand its core infrastructure initiative, or CII, for improving open source code security. That was initially set up in the aftermath of the OpenSSL Heartbleed vulnerability in 2014, which those of us fondly, maybe not so fondly, remember. In a video interview at the Open Source Summit, Jim Zemlin, who's the director of the Linux Foundation, explains why CII remains a critical effort for the organization and what's coming up next to help improve open source security. What gives me a little bit of hope is that Zemlin is quoted as saying, most security vulnerabilities are just bugs. And we've actually said the same thing on our application security weekly show. So we're in alignment on that one. Hopefully they make some improvements to the open source security as the details of exactly how they're doing that are kind of light. Although I encourage our listeners to go check out the article and the associated video. Google's Titan security key is a tiny device similar to Yubico's YubiKey that offers hardware-based two-factor authentication for online accounts with the highest level of protection against phishing attacks. 
I don't know about that. That was a quote from the article. However, Google's Titan Key is now widely available in the United States. A full kit for $50 is on sale, which includes a USB security key, Bluetooth security key, USB-C to USB-A adapter, and a USB-C to USB-A connecting cable. I thought that was kind of interesting that the kit came with that whole thing. I am highly skeptical of the security that revolves around the Bluetooth aspect of this particular key. Maybe some more information in uh, upcoming episodes. Now Chinese uh, researchers at QHU 360 NetLab have discovered that MicroTik routers, that's 370,000 potentially vulnerable MicroTik router, micro routers, uh, of those more than 7,500 devices have been compromised uh, to enable a SOX4 proxy, which allows attackers to actively eavesdrop on the targeted network traffic since mid-July. That's very interesting as several years ago when I was uh, in 2007 researching and writing the book for hacking WT54G routers, I speculated that if an attacker could mask their presence on a router and simply mirror the traffic, whether it's uh, via packet capture or proxy server, that the end users probably would have no idea that this was happening. Fast forward to today, and that's the attack we're reading about in the news. I hate to say I told you so, but no, I, I won't. But I did tell, tell you so. Uh, thanks to the way Alexa handles requests for new skills, those cloud applications that you register with Amazon, it's possible to create malicious skills that are named with homophones for existing legitimate applications. It means you call out a skill and someone's created a malicious skill that sounds like the skill that you think you're accessing uh, and really triggers attacks to happen. Uh, Amazon uh, made all its skills in its library available by voice command by default in 2017, and the skills can be installed onto the customer's library by voice. Previously, you had to go into the Alexa app, and I'm sorry if I'm triggering your device in saying that, uh, but there's no other way to say it other than it's the Alexa app, uh, and ha having to manually enable those skills inside the app on your phone. Um, so this is interesting, difficult to target, but a concern for Amazon users. Um, so it, it's interesting when you say things that are unhackable, usually people find a way to hack them. And as was the case two weeks ago, uh, when it seemed safe to say that John McAfee's supposedly unhackable cryptocurrency currency wallet had been hacked. Uh, it has been for nearly four weeks since the first security researchers reached that conclusion. However, uh, today, in the wake of yet another hack, uh, more details are in the article, uh, the wallet maker BitFi has uh, declined to admit defeat. But again, if you say something is unhackable, someone will probably hack it. So there you go. Xavier Mertens, uh, a senior handler for the SANS Internet Storm Center and freelance cybersecurity consultant and all around generally nice person as well, uh, found that more than 3,700 3D printers directly connected to the internet. He says these printers are controlled using open source software packages, uh, package Ocu Octoprint, but it's likely there are other tools that are similarly effective, uh, affected rather, Octoprint is meant to be exposed in this, is not meant to be exposed this way uh, and explains in the documentation how to display the software in a safe way. Um, but it is uh, a vulnerability nonetheless. And if you have a 3D printer exposed to the internet, people can actually download the things that have been printed on it and potentially expose um, you know, information that you don't want to be leaked out to the internet. I also suppose you could change the parameters of that 3D pr printer potentially causing some damage or errors in manufacturing. <clears throat> uh, in the case of Sonar Snoop, which is the new attack against phones, which is highly theoretical at this point, the information the hacker's looking for in a side channel attack is your unlock password. Instead of brute forcing your password, though, by trying all the possible combinations uh, or looking over your shoulder or all the other methods we've talked about in previous ex episodes, Sonar Snoop, exploit secondary information that will also reveal the password, in this case, acoustic signatures from entering your password on the device. Yes, look for that in Hollywood and, and maybe a real-life attack uh, in 10 to 20 years, perhaps. So nothing to get up in arms about today. However, we're going to take a short break and come back with our expert commentary guest today, Mr. Ron Gula. So stay tuned. 
Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash HNN. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. Welcome back, everyone, to Hack Naked News. Want to introduce our guest for today, who's going to be talking about political campaign security, Ron Gula from Gula Tech Adventures. Ron, welcome. Hey, Paul, glad to be here. How are you? I am well. It's nice to have you on the show today, Ron. And Not too long. Um, you know, we're always, uh, we try to stay neutral on the political front. I think we've done a good job of that over the 14 years that we've been uh, doing the show. However, you, you can't help but talk about some of the cybersecurity events that are happening that are related to today's political campaigns. And that's everything from local, state, and government all the way up to uh, the election for president. So, Ron, you wanted to comment today on political campaign security specifically. Uh, and, and what does that entail exactly? So, so, Paul, when you go and run for a Senate position in the U.S. Congress, huh. you're going to raise a lot of money. Sure. And you're going to spend almost all that money on getting votes and not on securing your your network and your campaign. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a problem. As everybody knows, when you run for an office, you have a lot of uh, chances to kind of screw up, maybe in the primary, maybe get some dirty laundry outed and things like that. But the, the environment is so hostile that if you have poor cyber hygiene, you are going to get, you know, any dirty laundry you have is going to kind of get out there. And that could be done by a nation state. It could be done by a competing party. It could be done by the media. And it's a great thing that we could probably help these people running for office to stay secure. Because if we get them while they're running, once they get into office, they're going to make better cyber policies. Is, is the current belief today that when you're running for political office that I feel some protection because there are state and federal laws that would protect me against these cyber crimes? I've Obviously, never heard any. Yeah, I've never heard any politician say that. If you, I've had a chance to interact with some folks in this mm -hmm. in this case. So, um, you know, typically when you run for office, your IT staff, you know, you you have very little money. Uh, you're not buying two-factor authentication. You're not buying commercial security, and you might not even be able to take donations from you know a lot of organizations who are giving out free security products these days because of uh, financial election campaign you know regulations. So it's it's a very difficult problem. Yeah, is there a thought process uh, in place behind changing some of these regulations so that campaigns can accept donations and apply those to cybersecurity? Yeah, there's a group uh, from Harvard uh, University called the uh, the Belfer Center. Uh, they've asked something, I think you'll put it in the uh, show notes, called the Cybersecurity Campaign Playbook. And this was done by Mitt Romney's campaign manager and Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign manager. And they're trying to not only give you know sound cyber hygiene guidance to people who are running for office, but also trying to make it easier for people who do want to donate uh, and not necessarily gain political favor, just make sure that the campaigns themselves you know, have the ability to uh, operate on a modern, on the modern internet. If someone would look at the first element here in this guide, Ron, and it says the human element, if someone, let's say myself, would like to give training to the people who are running for office in their staff about how not to get tricked in social engineering, for example, and general cybersecurity advice, um, would that be like a violation? Because I'm giving my services, right? I'm essentially making a donation. So what I would like to encourage people to do is to, to try to get involved. Uh, people who are listening might not ever think about stroking a campaign check to, you know, to sure. somebody they know who's running for office or they're happening to be part of a one political party or another. But you'd be surprised how far a little bit of advice can go without doing a formal consultation or, mm -hmm. or how, without providing a formal service. If somebody's so motivated to do training or do something like that, they have to donate. And they need to check with the, the campaign themselves for, you know, what's allowed and what's not allowed, depending if it's a local race or a nation state or a nation race. I can't say nation without nation state these days, right? <laughs> or a national race. You know, there might be different uh, different laws. But I'm, I'd like to just remind everybody, this is everything. You know, when you look at the city of Atlanta getting attacked, mm. when you look at people like the state of Ohio passing, you know, potential legislation that says if you're compliant with the NIST cybersecurity framework, you're not, you know, criminally liable for 
you know, for, for issues. There's a lot that can be happen, you know, outside of Washington, D.C. And those laws are all a little bit different on what you can give and, mm-hmm. you know, what you can charge. And, you know, much of the buzz surrounding DEF CON was about the um, uh, voting machine village. And there was a lot of controversy that surrounded that. And when it gets really controversial, I tend to, to tune it out, right? And I listen to experts that, you know, were talking about the types of devices that were there. I think the message and the intention was good that we want to be aware that voting machines could be hacked. But in for this topic, you don't have to hack a voting machine to influence the election. You just need to get it at the campaign before the voting even happens, right? Yeah. I mean, just looking at some of this current election cycle, we've seen some primary races where the leading candidate was up a lot. And then with one treat from uh, from the president, you know, the other candidate was 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 up. And uh, we've seen some other cases where there's been information about perhaps a family member that's been been embarrassed or perhaps a staffer that's been a little embarrassed. And it's kind of hard to say who's who's behind these things. Is it the opposition? Is it the media? Is it, you know, maybe a nation state like the Russians who are trying to disrupt an election or take out a decent candidate? Those are all very, very viable things. But the one thing that remains true is that most of these campaigns are not really spending a lot of money on protecting this. So it's an area where if you can volunteer, if you can help out a little bit, could make a big difference for the our democratic process. Is is it really that technology and social media have advanced to the point where it's really easy, a lot easier today to dig up dirt on someone? Has that really been the tipping point? Or is it more nation states are getting more involved with cyber? Like what's the, what was the tipping point? I think what's dirt is is very subjective. So for example, you know, the Mitt Romney campaign was hacked, wasn't really covered you know, four or five or whatever the, the, the two campaign cycles ago were. It's been written about in a couple books. But now that would be like, you know, front page news given our current political environment. So as we go through this particular election cycle, I think we're going to see a lot more attention to this topic. Mm. Yeah, I think it's an important kind of public service announcement to campaigns. What are some of the easy wins in your mind, Ron, that a campaign can do from the start that don't cost a lot of money? that can prevent them from some of the more common um, exposures and threats in, in this scenario? Yeah, so the playbook's pretty funny if you think about it in the political context. So one of the things they recommend is to adopt cloud services, i.e. no private email servers. Right. And it's actually a, an interesting thing because when this was written about four or five years ago, that was really, really good advice. But now if you're, if you're a conservative and you think Facebook and Google and Microsoft is kind of out to get you and Twitter's out to get you, uh, even though there's no real evidence that they're looking at our emails, you know, I've seen a lot of conservatives think, oh, I want to go back to the private private email. Another one's a real basic one is two-factor authentication. Um, and that's the kind of thing where if you were going to come and volunteer and mm-hmm. not really do something, you know, that, that was significant, you know, being able to get with a campaign, get all their phones, enabling two-factor authentication on their personal email and whatever email they're using for their campaign, that would be a great public service if we can just get something like that done. Yeah. And, you know, it depends on how much they're going to be targeted, right? I mean, even some form of two-factor authentication would be nice. However, if it's tied back to a cellular phone number, those folks could be victim to the attacks we've been seeing more and more of, which is I social engineer the cellular provider to get your security pin and then I get your number transferred to my SIM card. I can mm-hmm. see that attack being very valid in a, a campaign sense as well. It, they're targeting. it is. It is. And, and for folks who aren't political, if they are very apolitical, it's great to reach out to both parties. If you mm-hmm. lean one way or the other, though, with the, the current political climate, you really should focus on your, your party of choice. Yeah. Agreed. Fantastic, mm-hmm. Ron. So how's everything else going? Your, your website is uh, gula, it, gula.tech, right? Is the- gula.tech because it's gula tech adventures that's right gula tech and things are going well signing on new uh investments uh you had a productive black hat i know you're very very busy out there we were supporting a whole bunch of companies that were exhibiting and doing private meetings uh we're up to almost two dozen companies now which is which is a lot of fun haven't announced any new investments just yet we're focusing on a lot of the current companies and uh, we've been quite happy with the progress they're making. Bandura, for example, just uh, closed a $4 million round. And you had Todd mm-hmm. uh, on the show last week or two awesome. weeks ago. Yeah. Not last week. A lot, I'm of fun. <clears throat> a lot of fun with Todd as well. <laughs> cool. Well, Ron, thank you so much for appearing on Hack Naked News. Thank, thank you, you, Paul. Keep those elections secure. We will. We, well, we're going to try anyway. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for listening and watching to this episode. We'll see you next time.